It's great to see everybody. Thanks for being here today. If you're visiting with us, it's so good to have you. And if you are always with us, thanks for joining us both online and in the house as we're kind of getting towards the end of our Jericho Walls series. It's been a great summer, uh, but we are looking forward to what God has planned for us in the fall. You've already seen some of the signs out front as we prepare for God's next for us. Uh, fresh start, but not a new beginning. The Lord has uh, used this church in many ways, and we pray we'll continue to in phenomenal ways as we move forward. Jericho Walls, we've called this a courageous series because if you're gonna knock down walls, it demands some courage. For these walls are big, they can often be scary and intimidating and overwhelming. And as we've been walking through this series of the different walls we encounter in our life, it's been encouraging to hear feedback of how this has blessed so many people in their own lives in the walls that they're facing. It was April 14th, 1912. The White Star Line celebrated the launch of the RRS Titanic. As it sailed on its first journey, it was remarked that even God can't sink this ship. But after five iceberg warnings, five iceberg warnings, it is said that the operator of the Titanic wired back, quiet, I'm busy. Within 30 minutes of that last wire, at 11.40 p.m., the Titanic began to sink in those frozen waters that night. And so many people drowned after five warnings. We often hear the, the phrase SOS. We've often called it the save our ship, but it's the speaking of warning, warning, help, help is needed. And although I'm not very good at sound effects all the time, it's the beep, 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 that needs to be heeded in our lives. And I think that goes for our neighborhoods as well. Because within our own neighborhoods, many houses, if you will, are like that Titanic, and they need their own S-O-S. Oh, the house looks fine on the outside, but there's warning signs that there's something going down inside and people are feeling overwhelmed. They're fearful. They're afraid. But just like the Titanic's error, they make the mistake of trying to take on life in their own strength. And the wall that we're gonna tackle today gets built up slowly. This reluctance to ask for help. Any of you struggle with this? Some of the guys on staff said, oh, this is a message for all the men today. But I think the ladies understand this as well. We struggle to ask for help. It begins at a young age. For in your neighborhood, in one of those homes, is a little kid who the schoolwork just keeps mounting up on them. And they pretend to their mom and dad they know the assignment, but they look at the page and they're terrified because they know they're falling behind and they don't understand the schoolwork. But they don't ask for help. There's a college student. On the outside, they look fine. They're telling mom and dad they're looking forward to the fall. It's going to be a great year. But inside, their heart's pounding. They don't know how they're going to get that class done. They heard about that professor and how hard his syllabus is. They're going through a lot of those internal struggles, and they know how hard college is for them. But they put on the smile. But inside, they feel like they're going down. In your neighborhood, there's families. They're smiling, they're at the soccer fields, but they know their family's going down. And you can only fake it for so long. Maybe it's your business. You know you've delayed bills a couple months now. 
You smile to the workers and say, how you doing? You ready to have a good day? But you've been running like crazy. You're sweating and you haven't been sleeping because you know the work is not coming in. Things are not going that well. And you say at home all the right things, but deep down in your heart, you feel like the ship is going down. Maybe it's your health. You've ignored that pain for a long time now, but it's starting to catch up to you. It's something inside you that goes, I don't feel this is right. Um, it feels like I might be going down. Whether it's a project, whether it's your finances, whatever it is, isn't it amazing how much of a reluctance there is in all of us to ask for help? Beep, 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 beep. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. I mean, I don't want to bother other people. Hey, you know what? There's a lot more people worse off than me. I mean, I wouldn't want anybody to know that I'm scared. And the SOS doesn't go off. But what happens is the life that lives overwhelmed for a long period of time begins to eventually wear out and it gets exposed after a time period because you can only redline for so long. Our world calls it burnout. And did you know that some statistics say that over 50% of workers are feeling burned out in their job? It's up 9% after what we've gone through over the last two years. People feeling overwhelmed. They say there's physical signs and symptoms. Some of them include feeling tired and drained often, low immunity, often sick, frequent headaches and back pain, change in appetite or poor sleep habits are all signs that someone needs to hit the SOS. There's behavioral signs and symptoms, withdrawal from responsibilities. Some of the other behavioral things or, or even physical things are feeling tired, but withdrawal from responsibilities, isolation from others is a behavioral sign, procrastination, coping with food, escape, medication, or annoyed easily with other people, all signs, they say, of burnout. There's also emotional signs. Some of the emotional signs are a sense of failure and self-doubt, feeling trapped or defeated, a sense of detachment from the world, a loss of motivation, becoming increasingly cynical and negative in your outlook, all signs that you're struggling. And, and what are some of the reasons? What are some of the reasons? Well, well, one would be what I call the five lack ofs in the workplace. When you're in an environment of lack of, lack of control, working with little or no control over your work, if you're in an environment of lack of recognition, working with few rewards for good work, if you're in an environment of lack of direction, working with unclear expectations, if you're in an environment of a lack of challenge, working in monotonous or unchallenging field, if you're in an environment of a lack of margin, working in a chaotic or high pressure environment, all raise the risk of burnout. But what about circumstances? Circumstances sometimes come at us from nowhere, and I call them the five loss ofs. The loss of idealism, circumstances had taken away your dreams. I used to dream about that, but now it's not gonna happen. A loss of identity, circumstances have changed your role. A loss of passion, circumstances have affected your emotional energy. Maybe a loss of relationship, circumstances have changed your team and your morale. Maybe a loss of purpose, circumstances have robbed you of your purpose. All, all lead you more susceptible to feeling burned out and overwhelmed. And then there's the self-imposed ones. Too much work. You're not balancing your schedule well. Too much expectation. You are demanding too much of yourself. Too much responsibility. You keep taking on other people's responsibilities. Too much awake time. You're not getting the proper amount of sleep. Too much individualism. You're not cultivating supportive relationships. You say, yeah, that might be true. 
I do see that in my life. But you wanna know the number one reason for overwhelm and burnout? You wanna know the number one reason? This is my opinion, so you can argue with it. But I believe the number one reason that we burn out at times and get overwhelmed with life and feel like we're maxed out, all you have to do to find out the number one reason is I want you to walk through your house, I want you to go find a mirror, and I want you to look in it. Because the number one reason of self-reliance, let the preacher hear the preaching, is self-reliance. Oh, we are a victim society, aren't we? It's always someone else's fault. But the reality is, a lot of the gods we pursue are material, safety, comfort gods. And we demand our own selves to work, live, push, strive, gain, defeat, conquer, dominate in self-reliance. Anybody struggle with self-reliance in the house today of thinking we've got it? But the reality is we're sinking. That's why today we need to knock down this wall of self-reliance. Would you pray with me today? As we get to witness, as we get to see Joshua starting to truly get that working in tandem with God is greater than anything doing on themselves. Heavenly Father, use this message today to grow us, to help us depend, and help us to lean into you. For we're all susceptible to self-reliance. And it leads to the overwhelmed life. And Lord, you desire to help us you desire to come along our side. And so, Lord, I pray today that we put all distraction aside. I pray that you clear this place out of distraction, that we might hear from you and that we might listen to your word. I pray as we all lean into what you have for us, that we would leave today desiring to ask for your help. And we'll pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, Joshua had a problem with this, didn't he? Last week, we found out Joshua did not ask counsel from the Lord. And in doing so, it led to him going into a partnership with the Gibeonites who tricked him, pretending they were from a faraway country, but they were actually close by. And in being close by, They were able to dr trick him with the whole dry food far away and they went into partnership with each other. And you see in scripture the reason why. They didn't seek counsel from the Lord. Well, there was fallout from that. There was a, a group of kings actually who found out about this and they went out of their way to get together to try to fight back. And these five kings are spoken of in our Joshua chapter 10 as we begin today. It says this, and as soon as Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and its king as he'd done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. He feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were warriors. So Adonizedet, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoam, king of Hebron, to Param, king of Jeremoth, to Jephiah, king of Lachish, and to Deber, king of Eglon, saying, come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. And then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jeremoth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon, they gathered their forces and went up with their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. A confederation is building. The kings are going together. 
They heard Israel and Gibeon were together and Gibeon was a mighty army, so they moved together. And I don't know about you, but when you read a lot of names like that, maybe it confuses you or you go, okay, a lot's going on here. What's going on? And pictures help, so here we go. Pictures, all right? So the king of Jerusalem at the time, remember, Cain is not taken over yet. Jeremoth, Hebron, Lachish, Eglon, they're all getting together. They join in confederation. They head up to Gibeon and they're gonna take it on. All these massive Canaanite armies are gathered together. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal. Help, help us. Okay, and they said this, do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. They've all come in, get up here, and now Joshua has made a partnership with Gibeon, so it demands that he fulfills it. And Joshua, being true to his word, rose up, and he went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, it's almost like Joshua needed another shot of encouragement. Do not fear for them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. And with that word, it must have inspired Joshua, for he headed out into this massive military campaign against all of these kings at Gibeon. How overwhelming that must have been. How incredibly dooming that must have felt. And have you ever noticed when you're struggling with overwhelm, there's impending doom on your horizon? Have you ever noticed it's something where you're terrified of it and you're thinking about running? And, and, my, and my children of God in here know, if I run from something I'm overwhelmed with, it's gonna be like Jonah. He's gonna hunt me down and find me, so I've gotta stay in God's plan. But at the same time, you're just feeling the overwhelm of it? Well, Joshua is about to face five armies gathered at once. And one commentator writes, God must have laughed. Why? Because now Joshua doesn't have to go city to city. He's got them all in one place to wipe them out. <laughs> this is high productivity. This is called getting things done. God, listen to me. I don't know who needs this. God loves when human ability will not be enough. He enjoys those moments when his children feel so overwhelmed by trying to do it on their own, they go, God, help! About time, you asked. You're not worried? Not a little bit. You're not overwhelmed at all those kings? They're cute. They gather together. They look like they're having a good time. You're gonna ask me or you wanna do it on your own? Joshua, don't be afraid. Not one of them is gonna be able to stand before you. So Joshua, feeling some juice from God. You ever get overwhelmed? Get in the word, you get that juice, okay? He feels this and he says, so Joshua came upon them suddenly. What do you mean? Having marched up all night from Gilgal and the Lord threw him into a panic before Israel who struck them with a great blow at Gibeon. Stop for a second, how cool is that verse? You say, what? Stay with me. Do you see how the Hebrew writer is going out of his way to see Joshua and God are working in tandem? He goes out of his way throughout the rest of this text. Joshua did this, and God did this. Joshua did this, and God did this. In the, in the past, Joshua had to learn. Joshua's had to grow in his faith, but now he is learning to rely on God in the midst of the battle and God and Joshua are working together. And it's infused Joshua so much that he marched all night from Gilgal. Do you know how far that is? See, when you read the scriptures and you don't understand the geography of it, you don't gain as much juice that's in that verse. They just hiked 25 miles of very rough terrain. For example, it'd be like me saying, church, we got a problem in Plymouth Meeting Mall. Let's walk. Some of you are like, that Northeast extension threw me off. I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, right? I mean, that's a long way, 25 miles. 25 miles, not on their bikes, not on their e-bikes. They walk there. Wow. Love the word of God. And God, when they get there, let this speak. We're not called to be lazy Christians. Do your role. When they got there, God showed up. 
and he threw them into a panic. And as they fled before Israel, scripture says this, they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran and they struck them as far as Azka and Mekedah. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran and you all just nudged each other. Oh my word, they're at the ascent of Beth Haran, right? I was reading about that this week. Do you know what the ascent of Beth Haran looks like? Young people, if you're newer to church, the Bible's not full of Bible stories for felt boards. These are accounts from scripture and you can often go to the very location that these things happened. Here's what it looks like in modern day. From bibleplaces.com, here's kind of a picture of the ascent of Beth Haran. Kind of steep, kind of a difficult pass. And they say at the time of Joshua, which that is not at the time of Joshua, okay, that ascent was a very narrow ascent that not often more than two or three could go at one point. And as they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran, and I bring it up because God mentions it twice, or the Hebrew author mentions it twice in this passage. As they were going down the ascent, God shows up. Joshua's chasing them down the ascent. Who? He's fighting the Canaanites. He's fighting the enemies of God. These wicked people who would, who would kill their innocent ones, they would attack, they had all sorts of sexual debauchery in their religions, they was awful people, they were wild and crazy, they killed and murdered, and God had given them so many years to turn to him, but they did not, now God is enforcing his wrath using Joshua as that arm of judgment, and Joshua's going down the ascent, and God sends an airstrike. You say, you can't have an airstrike in that time period? Oh yeah, you can. The Lord then threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Ezekiel, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed with the sword. Joshua's going down the ascent, fight, fight. Oh, oh night, that is, oh, that is great. I mean, I, that's not in scripture. But think about that. You got your first recorded airstrike and anybody who knows anything about military knows the power of an airstrike before an infantry attack. And here God is sending hailstones and more are killed because of the hailstones than Joshua. You see Joshua fighting with all his might and you see God going, I got you, Joshua. What an incredible picture. And what's more incredible, somebody write this down in their notes. The Israelites weren't hit with the hail. I've got this picture. I don't like to reference movies, but you remember Elf where he's like this with the snowballs? <laughs> I mean, I, I just, I mean, I mean, this is unbelievable. Don't underestimate hailstones. May 1st, 1888, 250 people were killed in Moradad, India by hailstones. July 23rd, 2010, in Vivian, South Dakota, it was recorded the largest hailstone in the United States, 18.6 inches in circumference. Hello, two pounds. And, and I'm picturing that on me and I don't have any hair to block it. What a scene, what an amazing scene. They were chasing down these massive armies. Joshua, with just his army, is chasing them down the ascent. God is throwing hailstones onto them. And at that time, Joshua sees, it's gotta, he's got to notice the sun's going down. I got more work to do. I've got to clear them out as God's called me to do or generations could come back to haunt our families and all these things. And so he continues to hunt them, but he seems to have a problem because he prays something that I typically wouldn't pray. Scripture says at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said, in the sight of Israel, I'm picturing this, all these hailstones coming, the sword's going. He turns to God, he goes, I'm running out of daylight. Um, let me think, what should I do? What should I do? I should hurry. I should work harder. I should get as much accomplished as I can. I should yell at these soldiers and make them go hard. And then, no, you know what, and what I'll do? God. Make the sun stand still. What? Yeah, that's what he goes with. <laughs> sun stand still. At Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajah. The sun, and, the, and what? And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance 
on their enemies. I wrote down in my notes, I don't pray big enough prayers. That's what I wrote down. It's the first thing I wrote down. I don't pray big enough prayers. That really bothers me if my prayer life is, God, help me have, help the, bless this food to my bodies, right? Lord, help this buffalo wild wings bless me somehow, <laughs> right? And God's like, really? The bless you with acid reflux is what he's gonna do. <laughs> God, how could you do that to me? We're all laughing. I got my diet, God. I don't need to listen to all the do, 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 do. I can, I'm, I got this. I got this. Or maybe you don't. Joshua prays, son, stand still. And it does. And it's almost like Joshua expects you not to believe this. Or excuse me, the Hebrew writer expects you not to believe this. Because he wrote this. And the next verse is this. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, the book of Jashar. It was also called the book of the upright one. It was a collection of ancient Hebrew songs and poems. Make no mistake, there are extra biblical accounts that weren't part of the canon, which is God has, and I believe his sovereignty given to us. But extra biblical accounts that are sometimes referred to. Did you know in the book of Samuel, there's a book called the book of the wars of the Lord? Boy, I'd like to get my hands on that. You see this book of Jashar, although there's current books out there of the book of Jashar, make no mistake, they're fictional works or Jewish moral treatises, but none have survived. This, this document, they do not believe, has survived into modern times. And be careful with extra biblical writings. But at the same time, this is what Joshua is saying. Like, like the author of, he, of this book is saying, look, don't trust me, go to that book. This happened. Isn't it amazing? That sometimes we read these accounts and we'll be like, boy, man, that's hard to believe that the, the sun stood still. I mean, come on, clearly. See, oh, Chris, I don't want to do this. I, I love everybody loves church and stuff, but you know, we all know the sun didn't stand still. That's not how it works. You know, the earth, the sun is fixated and the earth rotates. And so the moon and the sun, they're fixated. We're rotating. So to say the sun stood still, it's kind of like, here's where I struggle. But, but hold up a second. Can I just push back in love just a second? You would probably trust the almanac and the many encyclopedias that have recorded things throughout history, right? Oh yeah, 100%. And, and you would trust the news, right? Okay. <laughs> I believe, I believe if you check those books, I say this in humility, but I believe if you check those books, they have recorded sunrises and sunsets. But if they don't happen, then why do we say that? Well, we know the answer. The answer is what? Observational language. We observe the sun rising in the morning. We say it's rising, even though we know the earth is rotating. Joshua, I truly believe, is doing the same thing. He's saying the sun stood still. Well, that means God would have had to stop the earth from rotating. Yeah, he would have. Well, do you understand how many things would happen if the earth stopped besides just the earth stopping, but of the disturbance in the atmosphere that that would create? I mean, the waves, the everything like that. You would have to be like the sustainer of the whole earth to be able to pull that off. which is what he is. You know, church, if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, there is no need to struggle with any Old Testament story. None. You believe that some dude died, spent a couple days in the grave, and got up and walked around? We do. And there's more documented history to the death, burial, and resurrection than most any other account you'll find. If you believe that, which we do with all our heart, then there ain't nothing in the Old Testament you're gonna struggle with because God is a massive God. Don't ever let the world make him small. There has been no day 
like it before or since. When the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel, so Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. The author says, there's never been a day where, where a man is out there going, swords flying, and he's going, God, hail, boom, I got you, Joshua, advance. Boom, I got that. Oh, Lord, we're running out of daylight. Stop it. We're good. Keep fighting. There's never been a day But make no mistake, God doesn't work for the lazy. Young person, you can't not study at all, not listen once, not take any notes, and then the night before the exam going, God, help me to get an A. That's not how it works. Although he has hooked me up one time, I'll tell you the story about that. God doesn't work for the lazy. He wants us to get out and get going. He likes to join us in the fight. He wants to see us take a step. We learned that in our Voyager series. Take the step, you'll see me. Take the step, you'll see me. Joshua took the step. We are to study, prep, plan, and prepare, but we need God's help. And you go, that's where I struggle, Chris. I don't know when I should take the lead or I should sit and wait for God. How should I act as I move forward? And how can I bring God's help in? Well, I've had a mentor in my life come along with a quote that I can't get out of my head. I'm not sure where I can reference the quote. So I'll just give it to you today. But I can't ever get it out of the head. It helps me in those moments where I'm weighing out my responsibility and God's provision for me. And here it is, here it is, here it is. Pray like it depends on God. Work like it depends on you. Now that speaks to me. Pray, Chris, like it depends only on God. This is not gonna happen without God, but I want you to work like it depends on you. Now we're in tandem with God and you'll be able to see like Joshua, that when you believe in his promises, when you use sound strategy, when you call on the Lord for help, you pray like it depends on you Excuse me, you pray like it depends on God and you work like it depends on you. You work and you fight and you keep battling, but you pray, God, stop the sun like it depends on him. Where are those kings at though? Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. Where are those mighty kings who were coming up against Israel? Where are they at? Oh, scripture tells us they're in a cave. And I think they're in a cave and you know what they're doing, I think? Because they've left all their soldiers out in the fields. They're hiding in a cave and you know what I think they're doing? I think they're doing this. Why on earth won't that sun go down so we're in the dark? Because they didn't know, they didn't get the heads up. Oh, Joshua told to stop. Come on, this is the longest day ever. They didn't look at their watches, that's just me. Look what scripture says, these five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave of Mechadah. And it was told to Joshua, the five kings have been found. They're hidden in the cave at Mecca. And Joshua is on his horse after him. And when Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished, scripture says, he, he comes up to them and he says, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies, attack the rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities for the Lord your God has given them into your hands. Roll the stone over the cave. And when Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Mecca. And I love this next verse. I love this. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Let me put this in modern language. And not one king or soldier talked trash on God again. Not one. And I want to give you a little more insight. Anybody want to step into seminary for a second? Do you know that the Canaanites worshipped two gods? Specifically, there were gods, Hadad and Baal. They were storm gods. They also worshipped other gods that were the sun and moon gods. So this means God attacked them 
with the very things that they worshiped to show them that only he is God. This is very similar to what happened at Exodus with the plagues. Oh, you want to worship locusts? Here they are. God's doing it again. Why? Because God is not mocked. Make no mistake, if you feel God is delayed in vengeance, he is showing great patience for he wishes all to come to him, but also make no mistake, when his moment of fury comes, it will be thorough. And Joshua approaches the five kings. Scripture says he opened the mouth of the cave He says, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so. And brought those five kings out to him from the cave and the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, king of Jeremoth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought out those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and he said to all the chiefs of the men of the war who had gone with him, come near. What's going on here? Put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and they put their feet on the necks of the kings. And Joshua said to them, do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous. For thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. What? Who said those words to Joshua in chapter one? Be strong and courageous. When Joshua was weak and afraid, And God was so, so patient with Joshua. You know what he did for Joshua? He said, hey, send the priests ahead into the river, okay? Let the priests go in and then you go across. All right, priests, go ahead. Okay, they're alive, all right? River's back, whoa, okay, let's cross. Okay, now, now, walk around, walk around the city seven times and scream. I can do that, I can do that. Ah, whoa, in you go. Up to AI with a few people, Joshua? Yeah, I thought we were fine. Wrong. God, why did we lose an AI? Why did you bring us out here? Get up, Joshua. What? What? You have sin in the camp. Deal with it and get back to war. Okay, I'll deal with it. God brings out the person for Joshua. It's him. Well, yeah, God showed him to you. Now go back to AI and get it done. He goes back to AI and gets it done. And now he's tricked by the Gibeonites because he relied on his own strength again. And now the Gibeonites are at battle. But our patient and gracious God says, I'll join you there and we'll fight together. And Joshua has grown so much spiritually now. He goes into his battles with his sword and he goes, you ready? And God said, let's do this. And he swings it while God joins him and you see them working together. And now Joshua is at a point spiritually where he calls everyone together and he quotes God and says, do not be afraid or be dismayed. Do you see they're married together, those words? Fear and dismay, fear and overwhelm. You wanna know why you have overwhelm? Most likely fear is crept in. And he says, do not be afraid, Israel, or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous. Joshua has arrived. We don't fight by ourselves, we fight with God. And how much now does this verse change having read that text? You know this verse, especially if you've spent any time in church. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The one who can make the earth stop and the sun stand still. That's who I call on for help. If that doesn't speak to you, let me change it a little bit. I lift my eyes to the government. I lift my eyes to my paycheck. I lift my eyes to my muscles. Are you seeing this? I lift my eyes to my brain. I lift my eyes to my GPA. I lift my eyes to my degrees. I lift my eyes to things that aren't God. For where does my help come from? My help comes from me, the maker of nothing. Why would we rely on ourselves 
when we have this awesome God who can tell the sun what to do. How many of you were in our Majestic series and we talked about astrology and the size of the earth in comparison to the sun? Can I remind you with a picture from NASA? Of, of, they aren't this close, but it's just for comparison's sake. If they were, we'd die. But look at the size of the earth compared to the sun. Young people, when you look out and the sun seems smaller than earth, it's because it's so far away. That's the size of this star compared to the earth. Now, can any of you find you at this scale? Anybody see yourself? Yet somehow we think, I got some questions to ask. It's unbelievable. Yet somehow we think when we don't even show, hey, I got this, I got this, I'm good, I'm good, take a break. Whoa, 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 whoa. You have the maker of that on your team and you're not seeking his help? No wonder you're overwhelmed. Yeah, no wonder I'm overwhelmed. We even had some fun and leveraged the Lou Gilgo illustration of a golf ball. If earth was this size at this scale, then the sun would be 16 feet in circumference. And so this screen is almost 16 feet. And so we said, look, look at this golf ball in comparison to the sun at that scale. That's the God that's on your team. Yet we wake up in the morning and go, ah, I forgot to pray. And we go into meetings and we go, I've got this, I've got this. And we wonder why we're scared. Our possibilities with God's help are exceedingly, abundantly, and beyond all we could ever imagine. And that's why I wrote down, I don't pray big enough prayers. And on top of that, child of God, do you understand that that credible God says, I want to help. I want to help. Yet there's a wall up, and it's the wall of self-reliance. But when we live in self-reliance, we're forgetting. Beep, 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 beep. We're going down. So why do we fall into this trap? Uh, we had just started dating, and I wanted to impress her so bad. And so Rebecca was coming out to where I was working, and I thought, I'm gonna take her to a romantic site. This is gonna be great. Got the backpack on. It's gonna be awesome. And we hiked up to this spot. And she was not a hiker then, and she's not a hiker now. But what we, we hiked up to that spot, and we had this great, I mean, this is going well. I mean, this is exactly everything I could have imagined it to be. And we're heading back, and we spent too much time there, as usual. And young people, just bear with me. This was back in the 1900s, so we didn't have cell phones. Okay, so we're walking back, and I knew to look for the trees that have markers on them. Just follow those. But I, I, I must have passed them. And I'm walking a little bit faster. And she's like, slow down, it's hot. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, are you lost? No, my dad taught me this Indian proverb. It says this, um, I'm not lost, trail lost. So I said that. I'm not lost, the trail's lost, okay? And, and, and I'm like, like, I just gotta find, we're good, we're good. The reason I didn't ask three other hikers that we passed on the Appalachian Trail that day was because I wanted to be the hero of this story. I wanted to do this my way. I had plans and I wanted the outcome to go the way I wanted. And I had fears that if I asked for help, she's gonna see that I'm secretly afraid because the sun's going down and I'm running out of daylight and I hadn't read this passage yet. <laughs> or I might have tried. And in my own strength, I wanted to see this through. And that's why we get self-reliant because we want it to be about our name in our way, our plans, our fears, our strength. And you know what the problem is with that kind of living? That's the kind of living where the ship goes down. Because we live like this, my name. 
And if I ask for help, I might not get the credit I crave. You ever struggle with that? I, don't, I, I kinda wanted to like have my name on this. Uh, am I my, my, my way? If I ask for help, I may not get the control I want. Because I, I want it to happen this way. And my, my plans, if I ask for help, I might not dictate the outcome I desire. I mean, my word, if I ask for help from God, he might change it and show me that this is actually a sinful plan and I kind of know it. And I don't want to go there. If I, if, I, if I address this, then I got to deal with my fears. And if I ask for help, I might have to avoid the things. I may not avoid the things I fear. And so much anxiety comes from trying to avoid the things we see out in the future that we're afraid of. If I ask for help, God might say, I'm gonna walk you right into the fear and I don't wanna do that, so I'm hanging on real tight and I'm overwhelming myself. SOS. I might have to do my, my strength. If I ask for help, I might not hide the weaknesses I feel. I kinda of wanted to be the hero. I kinda of wanted to, to be strong, but that's the beep, 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 beep life. And that ship is going down. SOS. But, but what if, but what if instead you called on the God who made heavens and earth? Watch the stress that could come off of you when you flip the script from self-reliance to the Joshua model of I'm going in, God, let's go. It's about your name. It's about his name. If I ask for help, he will get the glory through me. Do you know how much performance prison and comparison traps fall off of you when you make your life about growing his name instead of your own? Ah, whoo, that feels good. His way. If I ask for help, he will make the path straight for me. If I ask, if I look for his plans, if I ask for help, he will work all things for the good for me. I want his presence. If I ask for help, he will calm all the fears in me. How about his strength? If I ask for help, he will provide his strength to me. And so instead of SOS living, I propose SSS living. Because our possibilities with God's help are exceedingly, abundantly, and beyond. Anybody hear me leverage in Ephesians 3.20? All we could ever imagine. Sun stands still, life, prays to a God who is with them in the battle, who goes with them into work, who goes with them into their planning purposes. It was amazing the opportunity I had to explain to a nine-year-old who was struggling with fear in his basketball league this. You know Jesus is your savior, right? You know he wants to play basketball with you. Well, what he does? Well, he gave you the ability and he loves you and he wants to be with you. You ever try playing basketball with him? Because you sound like you're playing basketball with the devil. Because every time you miss a shot, you're such a loser, you're such a failure, how come you even play? That don't sound like God. How about you hoop with Jesus? That nine-year-old came back to me after having one of his better games and said, I prayed the whole game. Hey, young lady, about to do the piano recital, you know how your heart's pounding out of your chest and everybody's saying things like, you got this, and you don't feel you do got this? You know, you know Jesus wants to play that with you? What? Yeah, why don't you two play it together instead of worrying about what all those people think? Have some fun with Jesus. He gave you the ability. He can take it away the possibilities with God's help are exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ever imagine. Mom, he'd like to help with your day. Ask him, business owner, you like his help? He actually knows how to work this out. 
And you'll be surprised how he sends along just the right person or offers just the right opportunity or gives you just that inkling maybe you should stay away from this in the moments you need it. Why? Because you asked for his help. I got five verses I lean into that are sun stand still verses. First one, work for his name. Help me, O Lord, my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand. You, O Lord, have done it. I don't need the credit. Make it all about you, God. Help me. Here's a second one. Trust in his ways. Who's got it memorized? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And you know what he'll do? He'll come along and help you and make your path straight. But you gotta trust him and you're gonna be so tempted to lean into your own understanding. But a sun stands still prayer says, I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. But God, you're with me. I'm gonna trust your ways. You gotta yield to his plans. You might not like his timing. You might think you've got it all figured out. You might think you've got to control the outcomes. You've got to get your 401k to a certain spot. You've got to get this mortgage paid off by this year. You've got to protect your family from all outside threats. But the scriptures say, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it are in vain. They're laboring in vain. And then he says this, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Dad, you can stay up all night looking out, but unless God's in this, You're wasting your time because he's the one who can actually protect your family. And the reason you feel so much stress is because you're relying on yourself. Would you like his help? Find out in scripture, he stays up all night anyway. He doesn't slumber nor sleep. You can be the biggest CEO, big dude, whatever, but you have to go night night or you get tired. God doesn't. Count on his presence. He's coming. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. I got that on repeat, by the way, in my life. He's coming. I am so good at playing out a future happening and God's not there. He's always not there. And that's so the devil can scare me. I got to rebuke that lie in my head and go, you're going to be there in the future with me. And rely on his strength. Fear not, for I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I'm your God. Don't be overwhelmed. I'm here. I'll strengthen you. Yes, I'll help you. I'm going to uphold you with my righteous right hand. I love that. Because isn't there sometimes in life where we're walking like this? And he's going, I got you. Okay? Okay, it's all I got. I know. I'm with you. How can I honor you today, God? The sun's going down. Is there anything you're calling me to do with my life today? How about some application for the church before we go home? What can we do today? Well, the first thing you can do is number your days that you might get a heart of wisdom. And what that means is you think of every day much more intentionally than you used to. When you see the sun and you watch it set and you remember this story, you pray to the God who made that thing stand still. And he calls on us to do certain things while it's still today before it goes down. And what are we called to do? Here's one. You know what you're supposed to do today? Rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, another thing you can do in obedience to that wonderful God, you can encourage someone. I love this verse. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you might be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I see that sun going down. I got to encourage somebody while it's called today. Here's another thing scripture says you could do today. Forgive someone today. Be angry and don't sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. You know what you can do today? You can trust today. Many of you have this verse memorized. Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow, worry about self. Each day has enough trouble of its own. God, I want to honor I want to honor you. I want to rejoice today. I want to encourage today. I want to forgive today. I want to trust today. But the greatest thing you can do is surrender today. Acknowledge and take to heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth below. There is no other. Self-reliance leads to a life 
that feels overwhelmed and feels like it's sinking. You got a hand above the water. But isn't it good to know that's exactly where Peter was? He got out of the boat and the waves began to hit him, the circumstances of life, his environment, all the things that could lead to overwhelm. And he started looking at them and he went down. And what did Jesus do? Came over and he held out his hand. Maybe you've been attending church and you know that you've never, ever surrendered your life truly to God. And you're feeling like that and you're putting on a smile, but this is how you feel. I got great news for you today. Great, great news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grab it. But I don't deserve, grab it. But look at me, grab it. And once you grab hold of that thing, you've taken care of the number one problem. You've saved your soul. And now you're holding on to the life raft who wants to help you through every storm that comes. Why not grab it? Child of God, reach the other hand onto it again. And tomorrow when you wake up, you go into that meeting and before you open the door of the meeting and your heart's racing, you go, God, go in there with me today. Young person, as you approach this fall, I said, look, fall, this, Lord, this year, Lord, I'm not doing this fall at college without you. That overwhelmed soul that's living in chronic pain and they're so discouraged, I'm not doing another day without your word. Hold on to the life raft. So much freedom comes from releasing self-reliance.